Hello, this is Clayton Vance uh, coming to you from Timeless Homes. What we're, our goal here is, is to share with everyone um, the answers to the question that most people ask me about how do I make a more timeless house? And it's weird because the answers to that question we try to put on just a, kind of the physical results of design principles but all of the fundamental underlying uh, kind of premises that generate those principles um, are just as important as the principles themselves. And it's the fundamental underlying stuff about order and community and um, beauty, goodness, truth, all that type of stuff that is weird. It, it's, it's at, the, it's at the, the fundamental level of understanding, um, I guess the fundamental level of analysis and trying to understand what it takes to make beautiful things. Beautiful cities, a beautiful life, a beautiful house, um, beautiful furniture, a beautiful craft, a beautiful anything, right? Um, and, and so this is, I guess, just my thoughts of what's going on in the world right now since it's upside down. I mean, have we stayed inside for a few months with coronavirus and turned out that, I mean, the experts just disagreed. My experience where I live, people, everyone who got it recovered. My dad worked at a, at a ICU. He was a physician, pulmonary physician, worked at an ICU bed in Connecticut um, for a couple months um, working on COVID patients uh, on a COVID floor. and. Uh, he, he lost just a couple, not too many, and and most of them recovered. And and then and then he ended up with a heart attack and then had to quit. And so I guess too much stress. But but it's it's rough because it in thinking about where the world is right now between can you believe anything the media tells you? Where is truth? If we look at that fundamental triad, goodness, beauty, and truth, where's goodness? Where's beauty and where's truth? And if the media isn't giving you any truth and all they're feeding you is a whole bunch of not goodness, but evil in terms of who's doing evil and what's evil and all this other stuff because apparently sells, where, where do you find information in order to make a better world? If, if that's your pursuit, I wanna, what, what is my contribution? What can I do to make this world a better place? It's not going to be found in being entitled and trying to get something for nothing. It's not going to be found in um, what the world owes me. That just leads to complete emptiness and hollowness. And that relates to architecture. And I'll bring it back to that. Um, but all of the protests, whether justified or unjustified, um, all of the coronavirus stuff, same thing and who knows what the future holds with this election year coming the bigger idea than just a timeless house is a timeless community and um alberti a renaissance um architect and philosopher and theorist and he wrote a treatise and one of the things that he said in his um, 10 books on architecture was was you have to imagine the city as a house and the house as a city where you have all of the same essential components that make the thing up and and you design it so that each system is properly maximized to its fullest potential and and that's what we're going to do is look at i mean these things at those different levels of analysis because without that you end up with completely honestly hilarious uh, and idiotic autonomous zones <laughs> in Seattle. And it's ironic because I don't see the news really covering Chaz or CHOP or whatever they're calling themselves now. And if you look at architecture and community and the architecture the community produces is the symbolic representation of what the community values and you look at what they have, um, tents and graffiti, they've destroyed architecture. What does that say about the values of the community?
If you plant a tree, it takes a long time to grow. A long time to grow. And 40 years, if you planted that oak, oak, oak um, acorn, you know, 40 years, you're gonna have a pretty majestic tree. But it took a long time to get there. And weathering a lot of storms, going through a lot of dry spells, and wet spells, and every single type of climate and weather you could possibly imagine, possibly some fires, who knows what, but in the end, you have a beautiful tree that's majestic, that's solid. And it only takes just a few minutes to tear the thing down. When you look at how long it takes to construct a building, when, how long it takes to construct a city, those things can be torn down in a moment. All it takes is a bomb. Um, the same goes for civilization and society, which is the constituent elements, the people that actually create the city. So if you're looking at how do I, answers to the questions of how do I build a timeless house, if we really want to do a good job, we should be asking the deeper questions about what, what, what are my contributions and am I engaged in the pursuit of goodness, beauty, and truth rather than um, evil, opposite of goodness, ugliness, instead of beauty, and lies, a deliberate misinformation campaign or, or the deliberate uh, pursuit of, tri of deception versus um, authenticity and, and um, truth. And truth is different than honesty, is different than facts, is different than all these things. And truth, um, what we're talking about is that, that the, the big idea of the, the highest potential good in a particular set of circumstances. So what is going on in today's world and what can we do about it? Um, cities apparently are falling apart. And why? I've lived in cities, just so you know, I've, I've lived in um, Los Angeles and Glendale, California. I've lived in Roseburg, Oregon, which is a small little lumber town on the conservative side. I've lived in Richmond, Virginia. I've lived in, um, in Haddonfield, New Jersey, in Chicago, Illinois. It was actually a suburb of Haddonfield, but I claim Haddonfield since that's where I worked and where I lived in Voorhees sounded it was about the same as how it sounded. Sorry if you live in Voorhees, but just want to throw up saying the name. Um, in New Jersey, lived in Norwalk, Connecticut, um, and Rome, and spent uh, a little bit of time in Bath, England, and uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, all, all around Utah, southern Utah, northern Utah, and also Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I have lived in every quadrant of the US and have traveled fairly extensively. And my entire life goal is just the pursuit of understanding what makes beautiful places. And why do we travel to these places? We travel to them because they have character and because they're beautiful. They have character and because they're beautiful because of local cultures and because of the architecture which is still there from when we used to actually build beautiful architecture. <clears throat> Everything prior to 1920. When people rise up against stuff and try to tear down the civilization, it's interesting because it's the civilization that even permitted them to be at a place where they could do this and gave them the freedom to be able to do this. What we've found is more and more often um, over the last 20 years, 30 years, is more and more gated communities uh, pop up. And it's, in essence, what those are is medieval villages, walled villages, because that's what they're walled villages, um, that uh, rely on all the outside uh, perimeter for all of their resources. But within it, they're secure, they're fenced in, there's guards at the gate, only certain people can come and go, and those people are restricted. And there's a lot of rules within the community. And I, 
I think that the more those things pop up, it's kind of this underlying um, I desire or wish or fear that we're all trying to fulfill of, of anticipating or recognizing or feeling that the place where we live isn't secure. And I remember when I was a teenager walking out to my car and having our car broken into, um, and that was the first time I really had something really stolen. And it was a pretty dang expensive uh, stereo that we had put in this car that us, me and my brothers, who were, were all in high school together, we drove around. And so obviously it was some high school kid who s stole this. It was like some $1,200 stereo. And for, you know, for the early 90s, that's a pretty dang expensive stereo system. And it was, it was something else and it was gone. And I feel completely violated. It's weird, this sense of ownership is critical to the building of community. All the people who are promoting socialism and that type of stuff and communal ownership and all these other things, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, because when you look at socialist architecture, go back, look, look at socialist architecture. The values that created socialist architecture where everything was equal and there was an equal distribution of so-called stuff, it is the most hideous, ugliest, um, dead, lifeless place you could ever want to live in your entire life. It's just absolutely terrible. And it's, it's weird. When I was watching the news the other day, there was, some, there was a lady who was, you know, we're talking about burning everything down and here's why we're burning it down. And she said something that, that struck me and I, and I get it. She said, well, we don't own anything here. And so that's why we're burning it. It's not ours. We're not burning our stuff. We're not burning our city down. We don't own anything. And that's not a direct quote, but it was in essence, that was the sentiment. And, and I, I get that. Yeah. When you actually don't own anything and you work your entire life to actually not own what it is that you've been working for, it becomes demoralizing to a point that revolutions like this pop up. Because no one intentionally, if you worked enslaved and um, worked, I pr probably shouldn't have said slaved, if you've worked your entire life for something, or even a portion of your life for something, and you've reaped the reward for your labor. You don't go just burn it down because there's a sense of ownership. There's, there's time and you invested into the thing that, is, that, that it is that you are investing in. And to reap the reward of the investment, whether, you know, if you're a farmer, if you're at any job, whatever, you, you understand that when you sow and you plant at the beginning, you reap in the end. And the more we detach ourselves from nature, the less we understand about natural systems. And the less we understand about natural systems, the less we understand about ourselves since we are a natural system. And, and, and so we, we focus so much on technology, so much on the pursuit of um, cheaper, faster, and uh, more efficient. And I'm just telling you, sometimes it would be good to take a look at that tree that takes 40 years to grow and just be a little bit more patient, particularly when it comes to building our communities, building our architecture, building our houses, understanding finances and money and what we should be investing, quality of things, and that type of stuff. And somehow be able to have an environment where people, regardless of class, can actually own something that's theirs. And, and it's, it's that sense of ownership, both in terms of your personal circle, your familial circle, whether it be your apartment, your condo, your whatever, and the community that you're a part of that generates something way more stable. 
if I live in a community, for instance, I mean developers, we, we've become so focused on earning money, which is a, we need and we need to do that, but there's this balance you have to play. I mean, for, when it comes back to architecture, and this, all this revolves around architecture and communities. So go with me here on this little brain train, this, this thought here, is when developers go into an area, develop a whole bunch of land based on zoning codes that we fabricated to um, prevent factories from being adjacent to houses, which was a fine thing, but now they've gone a little bit too um, draconian. Um, <clears throat> when they come in and they develop something and bail, and they don't actually live in the community they developed, you can rest assured that they were just there for money. So they're trying to get as much money out of it as as they possibly can. So their investment into it is as little as they possibly can. And so when you're in a community where people are investing as little as they can, the quality is just not gonna be there. If the people who build the community live in the community, um, people are gonna be investing a little bit more and the quality is gonna be a little bit better. If you know that this is gonna be handed down to my kids, and my kids' kids, and my kids' 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 kids, and then this community is gonna be solid for 100, 200, 300 years, you're gonna be putting, and you're gonna be putting stuff up that lasts, but we've become so transient and, and so temporary that when people ask me about, how do I build a timeless house? It's like, we can't today. We just can't, it's impossible. We can't build a timeless community because it's not how the majority of us are programmed anymore. We think about getting in and getting out. And, and we've lost all sense of community, particularly in neighborhoods in cities that used to be real communities. And those communities were built around families as the core unit because the individual is the most important unit and what that person can do and contribute in terms of goodness, beauty, and truth. Then you have the family, which was the second most important unit within societies, and outside the family, then it was typically a church group or some sort of really tight-knit social group within a geographical area. And then outside that, you have your neighborhood on a community level, and then your cities. But as soon as, as, soon as I do business with you and you're never gonna see me again and I never see you again, all of a sudden that trans, there's, there's risk involved in the transaction because you can screw me and then go off and then screw someone else. And the ease uh, to be able to do that because we can just get around so easy and, and everything, it's, it, it's the same thing that happens with our architecture and our building because builders can go screw someone and do cheap shoddy work and then move on to the next person, move on to the next person. And, and these so-called iterative games over time are are all jumbled because we're no longer really associating with the people who we're, we have to actually live with. When you have to live with the people and you don't just have the option to just run away or tear down the house, um, you have to learn how to, how to negotiate um, proper living conditions. And if we were actually putting up stuff that was beautiful rather than just cheap, transient, real estate investment stuff. I guarantee all of our communities would be better because people would be excited again about, wow, what are you building? Wow, that's cool. Wow, maybe, I mean, can I come help throw in something or put on a yard or, and the people would start helping each other because people would realize that, you know, we're all stretching ourselves to become better and actually put up better things and put up stuff that we consider to be beautiful that we consider to be timeless, that we consider to be a contribution to the neighborhood rather than just some stupid, stupid thing. We might be, become better neighbors and we, we might give rather than take. So all this stuff, George Floyd protests, destroying cities, vandalizing everything, graffitiing up all sorts of stuff, tearing down history, tearing down monuments, tearing down architecture, burning it up. Be careful what you tear down. I get that most of these things that are being like burned up are like symbols of capitalism, but it is capitalism that got us here. So let's figure out how to revise it so it's 
a little bit better for everybody rather than just the so-called few. And then the, the so-called everybody, my gosh. Let's start goodness, beauty, and truth. How do you build a timeless community, a timeless self, a timeless family, and a timeless house? Um, we can do it. We just have to deliberately pursue personal responsibility and accountability, humility and gratitude, and trying to contribute rather than tear down. And what I mean by contribute is actually really contribute. I'm not meaning telling someone, hey, you need to give your stuff to that person. That is stupid because that person never benefited from getting something for nothing. You never benefit when you get something for nothing. That's always a lose-lose proposition. You always have to put work in. And buildings take a long, the greatest buildings took the longest time to build. Awesome trees take a long time to grow. Great lives take a lifetime to make. And great cities take a, hundreds of years to create. All of these things can be torn down by the selfish actions and idiotic actions of a few people really fast. So let's start rebuilding together and come join us on our channel of Timeless Homes where we talk about principles that help create more beautiful things. And that's how I feel in today's, uh, where things are today. So hopefully we'll see you again. Subscribe and we'll be back. It's Clayton Van saying see you later.